Welcome to this hybrid medieval text course on creation in the Arabic tradition and Thomas Aquinas, presented at the Catholic University of Leuven in fall 2011. I'm Richard Taylor from Marquette University, also a member of the DeWolf Monsignon Center at the Catholic University of Leuven, and co-teacher of this course with Professor Andrea Robilio from the DeWolf Monsignon Center, Institute of Philosophy, Catholic University of Leuven. As you will learn through the semester, the Arabic philosophical tradition drew deeply on Greek thought and developed it in very sophisticated ways. Works from this tradition were conveyed into Latin in translations of the late 12th century and early, mid, early to mid 13th century at places such as Toledo and Sicily. For, re for Latin readers, these were the newest scientific materials and ideas available, and it allowed them to make use of the latest science to understand not only philosophical and scientific issues, but also the principles of their religious teachings and to form their theological thinking in a way coherent with science. Today my presentation is on the religious notion of creation in Islam, with particular attention to, this, to statements in the Quran. The Quran is the monotheistic scripture believed by Muslims to have been revealed to Muhammad who orally shared it with his relatives and then wider communities in Mecca and Medina. Those revelations are held to have first come to Muhammad when he was meditating alone in a cave outside Mecca in 610, and then to have come to an end with his death in 632. Orphaned when a child, Muhammad was raised by his uncle and assisted him as a merchant. For details on the life of Muhammad, which we can't go into in great detail here, see the Encyclopedia of Islam, edition two, or the new edition three of the Encyclopedia of Islam for valuable accounts. The Quran is not a descriptive account of events as one might find or one does find in the Old and New Testament. Rather, it's believed to be the very speech of God, and so in itself to have a holy character for Muslims. The word Quran means recitation, and Muhammad was told through the angel Gabriel to recite what was revealed to him. Muslims hold that none of the Quran was authored by Muhammad. Rather, it is a recitation of what God wishes to say to human beings to guide them to the path of righteousness and right worship in their lives. Together with the Quran, Muslims also find value for their thought and actions in the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, and the Sunnah, reports of the life of the Prophet, both passed on down through oral and written tradition. At the time of Muhammad, Arabian society was structured in tribal form, with each tribe having its own gods and its own individual allegiance to its own god, such that morality was tribal and not universal. Tribes combated over power and trade, but the custom was to take a break from contention for one month per year. This was to allow free and safe access for all for worship in the presence of the images of the tribal gods found at the black stone called the Kaaba at Mecca. It's a picture of the Kaaba on the slide. Muslims believe this stone was an altar put in place by Abraham and his son Ishmael, an account found in the Quran. The revelation of Islam and its promulgation by Muhammad was a powerful threat to the tribal structure of society for many reasons. Simply put, allegiance to one God meant a universal morality and a direct connection between the individual and the deity, without a mediation through particular tribal values, tribal beliefs, or tribal leaders. With this, Islam was meant to dissolve polytheism and to disrupt the old ways. It was revolutionary. Not surprisingly, this resulted in much conflict before and even after the new religion was established. Tribal rivalries for wealth and power continued strongly in spite of the call for unity issued by the Quran. While we cannot go into depth here on these matters, let me just provide one comment about Islamic conquest and conversions. The conquests were for the most part for the sake of economic welfare and not for conversion of the populace. Forced conversions were not paramount, but rather control of regions and cities for the economic value of tax taxation was paramount. Even after the time of the rightly guided caliphs, caliphs al-Rashidun, 
the first four caliphs after the death of Muhammad, the Umayyad dynasty, after conflict, conflict over succession, was little interest in widespread conversion, something that came about only after that dynasty was overthrown and succeeded by the Abbasids. The Encyclopedia of Islam, edition 2 and edition 3, are, as indicated earlier, valuable resources for the understanding of many of the things that will be discussed in this course. But in the Encyclopedia of Islam, second edition, there's a particularly valuable account of the idea of creation in the Quran. So here I will draw on that Encyclopedia of Islam edition too, because it's more widely available. The key terms are Huduth, Halk, and Ibdat. Huduth means often a new appearance, something happening anew, de novo, to use the Latin equivalent. In this sense, one speaks of Huduth al alim or the coming into existence of the world. This notion of novelty or newness is also found in philosophical contexts indicating contingency or temporal origination or even generation. In the Quran, Chalk is the most frequent word for creation and includes the senses of making from something material, the sense of placing in something or placing someone in a new position, and what may what one may call creation ex nihilo. Quranic terms for God as agent of this are al khalik creator, and al-bari, maker. Language in the Quran is not philosophical in its own right, but rather religious. Nevertheless, doctrines set out there of interest to philosophers, and sometimes language quite relevant to philosophy is found, as we see in this short phrase from Surah 7. We created you, and then we gave form to you, from the latter verb sawara, the word sura is derived. In philosophical context, this word is the standard rendering of the Greek eidos, a term used by Plato, Aristotle, and later philosophers, which is commonly rendered as form in English. In that philosophical context, to give form to something is to give being or existence to something. For philosophers of the Islamic tradition, then, passages such as this are sometimes of extremely great interest. Our focus here is on the issue of creation ex nihilo as one of the senses of the verb halakha and on related Arabic forms from the same root, ha, la, kof. The general sense of halakha as creation ex nihilo is clearly present, even with phraseology that eventually yields complex issues of interpretation. Here is an example from the Quran, quote, I created you beforehand when you were nothing, close quote. Even when the term nothing is found, it is something that can be very ambiguous and certainly invites philosophical consideration of its possible meanings. While it makes grammatical sense to say, when you are nothing, what does it mean ontologically or philosophically for something to be nothing? Here are two more examples. Quote, when God decrees a thing, he only has to say to it, be, and it is. And we only have to say to a thing when we desire it, be, and it is. But of course, in these contexts, the way the grammar is written, it appears that there is something to which God says something. Hence, there, it appears that there may well be something pre-existing that then comes to exist in another sense. At least these philosophical possibilities are there, and the Quran itself gives rise to philosophical thinking in this regard. Two more similar examples are interesting to consider. Quote, and the day when he says be, and then his word is reality, al haq And also, he created the heavens and the earth in reality, or in truth, bil haq The word for be is kun, from the Arabic, uh, the Arabic verb to be, and in this context, the word haq as reality or truth requires contextual explanation which the Quran does not provide in any full way. Here the suitable senses of those, uh, of those are truth, reality, and instantiation in the world. Surah 35, Fatir, originator, has the following, quote, 
Praise be to Allah, the originator of the heavens and the earth. He adds to creation, al-Halq, what he wishes, for Allah has power over all things, close quote. And also, quote, O men, keep in mind Allah's grace given to you. Is there a creator, Halik, other than Allah, to give you sustenance from heaven and earth? There is no God but He. Here are some more quotations from the Quran. And Allah did create you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then He made you in pairs. And no female conceives or lays down her load, but with His knowledge. Again, indicating God's omniscience and knowledge of all things. Another quotation, O you men, it is you that have need of Allah, but Allah is the self-sufficient one worthy of all praise. One might understand this latter quotation philosophically as claiming that God has no real relation to the world, while the world has a real relation to God. Certainly it's able of that kind of philosophical interpretation. Terminology from the root ba da ein is important in philosophical writings, as we shall see, but it occurs only once in the Quran. The term ibtida, from the root ba da ein, is found at Surah 2, line 111, as badi, the inventor, badi, of the heavens and the earth, when he decrees something, need to no more than say be, and it is. This is an important point because the term we will generally see as origination is ibdat, from the same root, a term which can also be rendered creation in the context of philosophical discussions. However, this requires careful philosophical interpretation, as we shall see next class. Recall the Hadith is a collection of sayings of the Prophet. In one Hadith, the remark is particularly interesting for those familiar with Neoplatonism. As we shall see in Neoplatonism, the first thing emanated or created is nous, al-akl, intellect. And here, in this particular passage from the Hadith, it is most beloved by God, and so that which is closest to God among created things in some sense. Quote, When God created the intelligence, he said to it, Come forward, and it came forward. Then he said, Go back, and it went back. Then God said, I have created nothing that I love more than you, and I will place you in the creature I love most. Islamic theological thought is called kalam, which means word, discourse, speech, and much more. Early theologians were not surprisingly literalists, but the complexity of meanings and the interrelation of ideas soon gave rise to a tradition of rich theological investigation, close to what today may be called philosophical theology. Mutazilites were middle-of-the-road theological thinkers between extremist camps. While asserting the powerfulness of God, they also asserted the rationality and coherence of divine actions as something essential to the deity. They were not literalists who said one must accept what is in Scripture, bila kaif, without asking how it could be so. And they were not in favor of reading the major key teachings in the Quran in a non-literal way as a philosopher such as Al-Farabi often did. Mutazilite rationalist theologians held diverse positions not always coherent with those of their fellow rationalists. Still, it's reasonable to consider Mutazilite those who insisted on a strong role for reason, especially regarding divine unity and attributes, divine will, the issue of justice in human moral matters, and much more. On the issue of conservation of creation, it was argued that a continuous creative power was required to sustain created things in existence. The tendencies of early literalists are reflected in the thought of the 9th century Hadith collector Ibn Hanbal, who rejected Mutazilite views on divine attributes and the necessity of divine rationality and justice in relation to human beings. He strongly and successfully resisted the 9th century mitna, or persecution, of those who held theological ideas contrary to those of the caliphs, several of whom held Mutazilite leanings. In the later Asherites, we find reflected that earlier rejection of Mutazilite views. Atomism was held by various members of each group, but is most often associated with the Asherites who elaborated and developed that account. 
rather than holding for a continuous sustaining of the created. The occasionalist Asherites held that the being of creatures evaporated from moment to moment, and that it is only through a divine recreation that things, themselves powerless because all power lies in God, could have a semblance of continuity. But the Quran required interpretation of some sort, or some sort of defense of its literal meaning. Since the Quran taught that God acts by will, quote, God creates whatever he wishes, close quote, and can be interpreted as holding for a temporal creation, the question also arose as to whether God is always a creator or came to be a creator. This and related questions display the philosophical issues implicit in the Quran and its interpretation in Kalam, questions prompted by the text and later also by translations of philosophical texts into Arabic. Once falsafa or philosophy began to gain some footing in the intellectual context of the court of the caliph, it required defense, since it made claims about the universe and God which could be compared to the revelations in the Quran. Philosophers such as al-Kindi and later Ibn Sina or Avicenna had to deal with issues in the tradition of Kalam and also with those arising in the translations of philosophical works, all the while remaining faithful to Islam and its teachings. Next class, we will consider important texts based on translations of neobotonic works in an examination of the pre avicennian philosophical approach to the doctrine of creation by al-Kindi, the authors of the Plotiniana Arabica and the Liber de Causis, and also Al-Farabi. Let me just give you a bit of a preview of what is to come in this course. What we will see is that the philosophical doctrine of primary causality found in Plotinus and Proclus played an important role in the formation of the understanding of creation in Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Avicenna, and also Thomas Aquinas. It's under the influence of this tradition that Aquinas explains creation using the doctrine of primary causality. He saw it in his Arabic sources and made use of it in an explanation of creation in his first major work, The Commentary on the Sentences of Peter Lombard. Here is what we find by Aquinas in the second book of his Commentary on the Sentences. Quote, the notion of creation involves two things. First, the first is that it presupposes nothing in the thing which is said to be created. Creation is said to be from nothing because there is nothing which pre-exists creation as uncreated. The second is that in the thing which is said to be created, non-being has is prior to being, not by a priority of time or duration, but by a priority of nature in such a way that if the created thing is left to itself, non-being would result, for it has being only from the influence of a superior cause. He then explains, quote, For those two reasons, creation is said to be from nothing in two ways. One is such that the negation would negate the order of creation in regard to something pre-existing, implied by the preposition from x in Latin, so that creation would be said to be from nothing because it is not from something pre-existing. That is with respect to the first. He then continues, quote, the other is such that the order of creation in regard to nothing pre-existing would remain affirmed by nature, so that creation would be said to be from nothing because the thing created naturally has non-being prior to being. If these two suffice for the notion of creation, then creation can be demonstrated in this way, and in this way the philosophers have asserted creation. He then concludes, however, if we take a third consideration to be required for the notion of creation so that in duration the thing created has non-being before being, so that it is said to be from nothing because it is temporally after nothing, creation cannot be demonstrated in this way. Nor is this conceded by the philosophers, but it is supposed by faith. 
Hence, it seems that Aquinas allows for a philosophical sense of creation which is very different from that of Christian faith, since the philosophers to whom he refers here include those who would hold for a necessary emanation of the world by the first cause, while the faith holds that God need not have created the world at all. These are just some of the fascinating issues we will pursue in this course as we examine the importance of the Arabic tradition to the thought of Aquinas on the issue of creation. Next class, we will delve deeply into the Arabic philosophical tradition as it struggles with the issues raised here earlier. Our goal in this, and in the course as a whole, is to come to understand key insights on the nature of creation in the Arabic philosophical tradition and how they were taken over by Aquinas and used by him in the formation of his own sophisticated conception of creation.